praise the Lord, everybody. Are you ready to praise and worship on a Wednesday night? The greatest day in history. Death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Sing it out. Jesus is alive. Oh, come on. He's alive. Oh, happy day. Happy day. You washed my sin away. And oh, happy day. Happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever. Change. When I stand, when I stand in that place, free at last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. In this joy of perfect peace, every pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. Oh, he's alive. He's alive. Oh, happy day. Happy day. You washed my sin away. Oh, happy day. Happy day. I'll never be the same. Oh, happy day. Happy day. I'll never be the same. Oh, happy day. Happy day. I'll never be the same. What a glorious day, what a glorious way that you have saved me, oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious day. We should have sang Happy Wednesday, Happy Wednesday. We will sing, 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 and make music with the heavens. We will sing, 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 grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Lift high the name of Jesus. What's not to love about you? Heaven and earth adore you. Kings and kingdoms bow down. Son of God, you are the one. You are the one. Come on. That we're living for. We will see. And make music sing, 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 sing. Thank you, Lord. Grateful that you hear us. Shout your praise and lift high the name of Jesus. You are the Lord. You are the love that frees us. You are the light that leads us Like a fire burning Son of God, you are the one You 
What does that make me? Who needed to hear that tonight? Give him a hand clap of praise tonight. He makes everything glorious, including us. You know, the Bible says that we are going to be glorified with him someday. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Destined to die and pour down for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, but suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory is yours. All Father's plan Oh, he's sending us out A light in this broken land All authority All authority Every bit Raise your hands tonight and sing this. All glory. Yay! Every victory. Yes! Yes. Come on! Savior, worthy of honor and glory. Worthy of all of my praise. blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony everyone overcome can we proclaim that tonight yeah sing one we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony everyone
worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all of our praise. You are worthy, Jesus. Are you worthy? All of our praise. You overcame. You overcame. You overcame. Jesus. Jesus. Awesome and power forever. Awesome and great is your name. Great is your name. Great is your name. You overcame. Let's sing it softly. Come on. Savior, worthy of honor and glory. Worthy of all of our praise. Lord, you are worthy. You overcame. Jesus, awesome and power forever. Awesome and great is your name. Because you Can you say praise the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, welcome. Welcome those watching my live stream. Hope you're staying cool. This is a great day to be alive. For me, any day is a great day to be alive. <laughs> oh, well. Isn't God good? I'll tell you, he is. I wanted to say something to you tonight. How many of you have seen the movie, uh, Well, I'll be dead again. Sound of Freedom. I couldn't think of the first word. <laughs> we saw it last night. How many have seen the movie? If you haven't seen it, you need to go see it. It's a true story, absolutely true. And if you go see it, wait until the very end before you leave to hear what this guy's got to say at the end. It's, I tell you, it just shook me up. And for those of you who know Pastor Troy at Open Door Church, he does the same thing this guy does. He rescues kids from South America, Africa, and I've heard a couple of testimonies where he faced some very dangerous situations, but he didn't slow down. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Well, Let's be praying for our kids going to camp and our upcoming crusade we're having here. Look in the bulls and all the information's there and uh, keep all that in prayer. And are you enjoying the book of John, Gospel of John? If we had no other book to live by, we could live a victorious life by that one. Everything is right there. Amen. Are you ready to give tonight? Oh, by the way, I wanted to ask a question. How much of the microphones that we need a piece? Eight hundred. Eight hundred dollars a piece. Whew. Never mind. I was gonna buy one, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I will. I am going to give towards that. But if you could give towards that, we would appreciate it. Uh, the the drums were donated. Thank the people who donated. God bless them for donating the drums, new drums. But we need microphones. Some of these old microphones, they're just they're believe it or not, they're wore out. So if you can give towards that, mark it on your. 
envelope, we'd appreciate it. Come on, ushers, and uh, let's receive an offering. <clears throat> I just want to say one thing. I've been serving the Lord for 50 Almost 53 years. 53 years. And not one time, not one time, even when I was disobedient and got out of the will of God, not one time did I lack anything. And then I've discovered many years ago about giving. I had trouble with it at first. Didn't make much money and didn't want to turn loose of it. But when I found out about the principle of giving and started giving, I've been blessed my whole life. Sometimes I haven't had nothing. And there's been times I've had more than enough. But through it all, God has never failed. Never failed. And he won't fail you either. Father, we just thank you so much for your love for us. And we thank you for these people who give to the kingdom of God, give to you out of love. And we ask you to bless them, Lord. I just ask you to bless the socks off of them. And we'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name. Yeah, it's a little difficult for us old folks to realize that uh, prices increase. I think our, our microphones were like $300 when we bought them last time, but that's been 10 years. So, hey, gas is going up too, right? Revelation 12, 11. This Sunday morning's sermon, I'm going to give you an appetizer. I'm going to give you something to think about. It's going to be on the, being the sandwich of faith. Revelation 12, 11 says they, we sang it tonight. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. We're going to be talking about the testimony of faith and dealing with what it means to actually live by faith this coming Sunday. The blood of the Lamb is God's part. The testimony is our part. The blood of the Lamb is God's part. The testimony is our part. But our part doesn't stop until we're willing to die. We're going to deal with that this coming Sunday. I believe that when we surrender is when our life begins. And it's time for us to surrender. There's nothing in this world to hold on to anyway. Amen? All right, I want us to uh, stand together. We're going to pray. We're going to dig into the book of John. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit tonight to be the teacher because he is the one that is the teacher. If anyone else teaches you, you're not going to receive anything that's life-changing. I mean, it's not the, the Holy Spirit is the only one that can change the inner man, and the inner man is the part that must be changed. It's the revelation of truth that comes from the Word that changes us, the two-edged sword. So if the Holy Spirit is teaching us tonight, then we have an ability to be changed and become more like Him. But what we've got to do, we've got to be willing to surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit as He teaches so let's make that our prayer right now. Father, we just say thank you right now for your goodness. We acknowledge you because we know that you are the answer to everything we need in this life and the life to come. But Lord, we also know that it is your word that is a lamp to our feet and your word is a light to our path and we need light today. We need your word today. We need something that is an anchor. We need something that is sure steadfast and solid that we can hold on to in the day that we're living in. And Lord, we know that your word is that hope 
And by the power of your spirit, you reveal truth to us through your word. And the Holy Spirit himself is the one that takes the word and plants it deep into our hearts. So, Father, we receive that tonight. We ask you to give us understanding, give us wisdom, give us a hunger and a desire for you that's greater than anything else in the entire world. Because, Lord, we know that you have everything that we need, and we choose to receive what you have to offer. We do it tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, you can be seated. John chapter 14, everybody get your Bible out, and let's do some digging tonight. Ah, wow. Has anybody been hot today? I definitely don't want to go to hell. <laughs> this is good. I'm excited about this word. So let's look, let's look, John chapter 14, let's begin with verse number 12. We got into a good par portion of this chapter last week, and we're probably not going to finish all of it tonight because it's just so rich. Verse 12, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you, got, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. All right, let's just take those uh, four verses and start looking at those. Verse number 12, he says, most assuredly. Now, when you read the word most assuredly, it means pay attention. In other words, what I'm about to tell you is something that will change you completely if you receive it. Most assuredly. Rest assured that what I'm about to say is a truth that is life-changing for you. And so he said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me. Now, that is, that is the priority of everything we need to consider in the kingdom of God. If you don't believe in him, none of this works. You can confess it. You can even pray it. But if you don't believe it, it doesn't work. And the, the description and the display of what you believe is by what you do. If you don't do it, you don't believe it. Just that simple. You don't have faith. If you live, if you live an ungodly life, you don't believe in what God says. It's just that simple. You can go to church every time the doors are open. But if you live an ungodly life, you don't believe what the Bible says about God because His Word is presents to us an ability to live in victory, an ability to live above sin, an ability to be an overcomer. If you live an ungodly life, you're not overcoming. You're giving in to the wiles of the enemy. You're giving in to his control. And then you face the consequences of your decisions. But if you truly believe the word, then you are motivated toward obedience. If you truly believe the word and you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you believe he came in the flesh, you believe God raised him from the dead, you believe all of this is true, then you're motivated to hear that word. See, if, you're, if you don't have a desire to hear, then that means you're not really motivated to hear it. That means you really don't think it's true. Because if you believe it, you will hunger after it. Yeah, I just got to draw a line in the sand. There is no halfway serving God. There is no half-heartedness. If you do the work of the Lord half-hearted, you, you, you are defeated. You're living under the curse. But when you do the work of the Lord all the way, you're sold out. There's no lukewarmness. You're either hot or you're cold. And if you're a believer, you should be hot, on fire, being consumed by the will of God and by the word of God. So he says this word. He said, he who believes in me. Now that means we have to believe what he has said about himself and about who he is. You've got to believe that he's the son of God. You've got to believe that he came in the flesh. You've got to believe that God raised him from the dead. And if you believe in the resurrection, then the resurrection gives authority to everything he said. 
The resurrection is proof that what he said is true. And there's so many things he said that we don't act like we believe. I'm not expecting anybody to say amen, so it's okay. I'm just resting. So many things he said, he's coming back for us. He said, I'm going to come back in the same manner that you've seen me go. He's coming back for us. We read the first part. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. I'm preparing a place for you, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to take you so you can be with me. Now, are we living like we believe that? That's the question. If we believe that, we're going to act like we believe that. We're going to have an expectation of that event happening. You see, you're not going to, you're not going to be living in, in sin and rebellion against God if you believe that the rapture could take place any day. You won't do it. Uh, so I'm just going to this first statement. He who believes, he who believes in me. And then he says this amazing statement. The works that I do, he will do also. The works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these, he will do. Wow. Where do we go with that statement? He who believes in me, he said, the works that I do, he'll do also. Well, we can look at a lot of the works that Jesus did. And you look at the church today and those works that we think about, he's not doing. We're not doing And then he said, even greater works than these will do. <sighs> so what are we going to do about that? Well, well first of all, we're going we're to get understanding. The Holy Spirit's going to give us understanding of what he's saying here. It's very important to comprehend this. He said, the works that I do, he will do also. So Jesus, in the three and a half years of ministry, I mean, until he turned 30 years old, there was really no miraculous things taking place in his life at all. He performed no miracles. He didn't pray for anybody. He didn't do anything like that. He lived just like you and I are living. A human being growing up. He lived without sin. He lived with a heart turned toward the Father, a desire to obey the Father in everything that he did. And then the day came that something supernatural happened in the humanity of Jesus Christ. He was baptized in the River of Jordan as an example to us about what we're going to need to do in our death and our burial and our resurrection with him. And then the Father sent the Holy Spirit to him, and the Holy Spirit himself anointed Jesus, and at that moment, the will of the Father began to de be displayed to the world through His Son, Jesus Christ, by the power, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit that was the Father displaying who He was to the world through His Son. So the anointing that Jesus lived in and the works that He performed, He did by the power of the Holy Spirit from the Father. That anointing has to be present. And that anointing is what happens to us when we get born again. When you get born again, you receive a supernatural experience that changes who you are inside, and the Spirit himself dwells in you. Your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at this now. He said, the works that I do, he said, he'll do also, and greater works than this he'll do. So I've heard all different types of understandings, and I've had a little different ideas about this in the past. And the works that I do, the first thing I think about, well, he, uh, he healed the sick, and he raised the dead, and he cast out devils. He said these signs will follow them that believe, so we have an authority to do some of those things that he did. But he, not only, he didn't stop there. He said, greater works than this you'll do. Now, how can we do anything greater than what Jesus did?
Just think about that a while. How can I do anything greater than what Jesus did? Well, you see, what Jesus did, he did by the same anointing that God gives to you and I. You see, what Jesus did, he did by the will of the Father, the anointing that lived in him. And the lifestyle of Jesus was a lifestyle of obedience. So the power and the anointing that flowed from Jesus was a, in direct correlation to his obedience to the Father's will. And the reason he did such great works because there was no sin in him at all and he was in tune with the Father completely. So the anointing that was in him, if it's in us, the only way you and I can live in any type of a victorious lifestyle is by doing what Jesus did in obeying the Father. Obedience produces the anointing. Just because somebody lays their hands on you doesn't mean you get their anointing. Your lifestyle is where your anointing comes from. So this is part of the problem. We're not seeing the works of Jesus and greater works because there are people that are living two lives. All right, let's go a little deeper. So our fleshly motivation when we read this, our human expectation when we read this, our selfish desires when we read this is Jesus did all of these miracles when he was here, and so I want to be able to do those miracles too. But I believe there's something more at work here. Because the work that Jesus did was a complete fulfillment of the will of the Father that produced the plan of salvation. And so what Jesus did, he displayed the Father to the world. And he displayed the will of the Father to the world. And he displayed the plan of the Father to the world. And he actually displayed the good news. God loves you to the world. And so the greatest work we could ever imagine being involved in is displaying to the world the fact that God is for them and he's not against them. God loves them. Jesus died for them. And so the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus, he said, he said, I am going to leave, and because I'm going to leave, the Holy Spirit's going to come. The same Spirit that's in me is going to be in you. And we know the story, the day of Pentecost, the church was born, the Holy Spirit moved into humanity, and from that day on, we had 3,000, we had 5,000, we have multiplied millions of believers on the planet today with the Holy Spirit living in them. Now, that was called greater works. If, you were, if we were to begin to make record of the salvations and the healings and the miracles that are taking place in the world present day, you'd find out that there's been a whole lot more happen in present day miraculous events than what happened in the three and a half years that Jesus ministered. But he even did so many things that the Word of God says the books cannot contain what he did. So that means that there's so much happening in the kingdom today that is far beyond what we are hearing, what we're seeing, and what we are understanding if we learn to trust God for the greater things. And so now then I've discovered something. The works are not about me so I can say that I can perform miracles. But the works now have, a, have become a part of my lifestyle in a sign of surrender to who he is. Because there's no anointing without surrender. So instead of seeking the signs and the miracles and the works, we need, to, we need to surrender everything and let the signs follow. So he said, I'm going to my Father. Now let's go to, to verse 13 because this is another understanding we need to get. He said, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So, verse 14, it says the same thing. It says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. All right, so he's, he's saying there's some things that can happen now, and what you've got to do, you've got to ask. And there's a certain way you need to ask. You need to ask in my name. But here's where we've messed up. Our natural understanding has made that a formula. 
If I just say something and I just say, at the end of it, I say, in the name of Jesus, that means I can get it. It has nothing to do with what he just told us. But our natural reasoning and our selfish mindset about the things of God is we want it for our personal gain and our personal benefit. So we think of the things that we want to ask for and we start asking for things and we say, in the name of Jesus. And so we think because we said, said in the name of Jesus, we can get what we ask for. And that's what we think that that verse means. How many of you have ever asked for something, asked the Lord for something you didn't get? Raise your hand. Oh, so something's wrong with that formula. Maybe we need some more understanding about what he's talking about here. Now, we do know the scripture over in John where he says, if you ask anything according to my will, I'll hear you. And if I hear you, then you have the petition you ask of me. So here's a, a, a guideline we need to understand. Whatever we ask must be his will for us to receive it. And many of us don't have a clue what the will of God is when we pray. Maybe if I just say it enough times, I can get it. Maybe if I repeat it over and over again, God will give it to me. Maybe if I just confess it louder, maybe God will give it to me. No, we've missed the point entirely. Because there is something in the heart that connects with the heart of God that causes God to respond to us. And it's not the much speaking, and it's not the volume of our prayers, but it is the effectual, fervent prayer. And that comes from the spirit of man to the spirit of God. Okay? So he says, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. I'm trying to think of something I'd like to have I want to ask God for. Yeah, hmm. I really, I'm trying to actually think of something, but I've got everything I want and everything I need. I don't, you know, I'm complete. I don't really need anything else, but if I was, you know, I can't even do it because I don't have a desire for any of that stuff. But you, if we're not careful, we, we get into this, this human mindset and we start asking God for things. And, you know, we want to keep up with the Joneses. They have that. God give me that. And so we try to use the formula to get it. Let me t I've got some use for you. That's not what he's talking about. But here's what he's saying to us. If you ask anything in my name, you've heard me, some of you have heard me teach on this, but let's make sure we understand this. Name. That doesn't mean I'm just going to say, give it to me, Father, in the name of Jesus. Now, your declaration becomes a part of who you are and what you're agreeing with in the Word of God from your spirit, but this is not a religious routine and a religious prayer that you say or read is not what gets God's attention. What gets God's attention, first of all, is faith. That means you're going to believe what He says. And for you to believe what He says, you've got to believe it all. You don't believe just the part that makes you feel good or the things that you want. Because before we can walk in the benefits of the blessings that God has, we must also walk in the obedience to what his word says. Because blessings will chase you down if you're living a life of obedience. So we've got to stop praying, God bless what I'm doing, and just start doing what God's blessing, and you'll have the blessing. So if you ask anything in my name, the word name is an interesting word. Different, a lot of different definitions involved in that but there's two parts to that definition that I want us to comprehend first of all the name represents the nature or the character nature or character nature or character so let's read it th this way if you ask anything in my nature or you've, if you ask anything in my character, I will do it. How does, what is that? All right, let's, let's try to 
connect this. Jesus, when he stood on this planet, he was a display of the Father. He had the nature and the character of the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when Jesus prayed, he didn't say, in the name of Jesus. He declared the Father's will. And he agreed with the Father's will. And he stood in the complete sinless nature of the Father. And the miracles came from him. Wow. So if the name of Jesus is more than just a formula that we say then that means that there must be a connection with his name that is beyond words that we speak. It must become a, a, re, a relational experience. And we find out in the kingdom of God, everything in his kingdom must be relational. You don't just go to a seminar and learn about God and get what God has for you. You have to know God. You don't know about him, you have to know him. And the only way to know him is to enter into a relationship of surrender to him. So if I'm going to ask anything in the nature of Jesus, the way that I'm going to receive the will of God, not my will, but his will, is by surrendering my nature to him. By giving him my robe of unrighteousness, my filthy rags, and let him give me his robe of righteousness, where now I stand complete in him. And now then, in him I live, in him I move, in him I have my being, in him I have his name. This is the nature of Christ, I have the character of Christ, and so when I pray for the will of God, I don't have to beg and plead God to do what I want him to do. All I have to do is stand in faith agreeing with his will that's already declared in heaven for me to have in earth. Ah, no, that's too simple. Well, this is going to get a little, uh, a little tougher as we go. So let's understand there's nothing wrong with praying and using the name because the name, that name is above every other name. In fact, let me give you this scripture that has to do with that in Psalm 138, verse number 1. Psalm 138, verse, 30, verse number 1. David is praying and he says, I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. And then look at this statement. Verse number two. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Now we get this into our spirit, it's going to give you understanding about how to pray. You've magnified your word above all your name. Now, we know the name is higher than any other name. He's exalted his name to be above everything. Everything you can name, the name of Jesus, is higher than that. His name is higher. But in this scripture here, we find out that God has magnified his word above his name. So if you will get the word in you, you can ask in his name because his word is above his name. The very simple definition, understanding of that is this. It, it, you know, when you go to the bank to borrow money and you want to become a debtor, so you go to the bank and borrow money. And they're going to say, okay, fill out this application. And you have to give them every detail about your life from the day you were born until today. And then give them your right hand, your right arm. And they say, okay, you put down that, that Social Security number, and they're going to run a credit check on you. 
They're going to check you out to find out if your name is good. And the thing that they use to discover whether or not your name is good is your word. Have you kept your word in past experiences? If you haven't kept your word, your name is no good. Let me give you some good news. The Lord's name is good. He's never changed his word one time. He's never failed to fulfill his word one time. He doesn't even know how to fail. So he's magnified his word above his name because if his word is true, then his name is good. So now then we, we get into the word, and when you live in the word and let the word live in you and through you, you're living in the nature and the character of the Lord. And that's when you can pray and ask anything according to his will. Why? Because his will is living in you. His word is living in you. You're an overcomer. Okay? You got that part? All right, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So we've gotten so caught up in a misunderstanding of grace to the point that we think we can just serve God and not obey the commandments. Let me tell you, if you're breaking the commandments, you are facing the consequences in this life and the life to come because the commandments are there for a purpose. The old covenant commandments were to deal with the outward man, but the new covenant commandments deal with the inward man. You got to get it right here or you can't obey any of the commandments. But here he said, now, if you are in love with me, if you are in right standing with me, if you are in a relationship with me, if you are in my nature and my character, you're going to keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, so we find out now this is a very simple understanding to find out if you love God. Because breaking the commandments are for self. They're all selfish. It's for my benefit. And so if we're breaking the commandments, then my love for myself is greater than my love for God. And it's amazing that he put all this together in these four verses. He says, you can ask anything in my name, and he says, I'll do it for you. And then he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So this is how we're now finding out if we are living in his name, in his nature and character. Because the love, I, my love for God is displayed by my lifestyle of obedience. If I, if, I, if I do something that is contrary to God's will and God's word, conviction comes instantly. And I have to make a decision. Am I going to not acknowledge that? Or am I going to repent of that immediately? Then when you see the lifestyle of other people, the things that they're doing, sometimes we're grieved in our spirit, we're troubled in our spirit because of the things that are out of order. But there's something about it, it, it hurts because you see that they are destroying their own lives by their disobedience to God. When God has a plan that is so much better for them and for all of us, if we love him, we'll just keep his commandments. Uh, and then he says, I'm not, you're not going to do this by yourself. So let's look at the rest of this. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Oh, did you get that? I'll pray the Father. He will give you another helper. We know who this is, the Holy Spirit himself. He came on the day of Pentecost. He's moved into us. Now he said, he is another helper. He's going to, not only are you going to just live by what you've seen me do, but there's going to be a helper that is going to empower you to do what you've seen me do. You're going to be an overcomer. Why? Because the spirit that is in me is going to be in you. You're going to go to the same cross. You're going to live a resurrected life. 
See, the reason many of us aren't seeing the works of Jesus in our life is because we haven't made it to the cross yet. There's no life without death. You got to die first if you're going to live. If you live first, then your life, your death is eternal. Let's just let, let's just die and let the Lord take over. So I'm going to pray the Father is going to send you another helper that he may, that he may abide with you for a few days, and then you'll have to go back and and get it renewed, and then you got to go back and get it renewed again, and then you got to go back and get it renewed again, and you got to go back and and you know, wow. When you, get, when you get full, when you surrender and you sell out and the Holy Spirit himself is indwelling in you, you don't have to be in every church service to, say, to stay saved. But obedience says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together, so you'll do that too. But you see, we, you got to understand that it, in, the, in the, that four weeks we were out, we didn't have church, you know, and we, we did all that separating stuff. Those that were true believers, that didn't affect them. They still served God. They still, because the helper is abiding in them no matter where they are. It's not about the building. It's about the relationship we have with God and with one another. So the, good, the next part about this, uh, next scripture on this is going to be, going to tie it together. He says, so the other helper is coming that he may abide in you, with you forever. And here is the helper. He's called the spirit of truth. Mm. Look at the next statement. Whom the world cannot receive. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. The world we live in doesn't know what truth is. Let me give you some words of wisdom. One of the wisest things you can do in today's world is turn the news off and stop listening to lies. And let the peace of God rule your heart and rule your mind. Because you're worrying about what's going on in the world is not going to change one thing. The spirit of Antichrist is at work in the world, and his spirit is unleashed in the world. But Jesus said, when this is happening, he said, lift up your head and rejoice. Why? Because the spirit of truth can live in you. And see, when you know the truth, the truth makes you free. Talked about that last Sunday, Sunday a week ago. When you know the truth, the truth makes you free. And that means in the midst of turmoil, the turmoil and the darkness of this world, you can enjoy life and you can live in freedom. You can live in victory. You can live in peace because this is not the end of it. My hope is eternal. So the spirit of truth, when, he, when the world cannot receive him because the world neither sees him nor knows him. So the world cannot even comprehend truth. They don't know the Holy Spirit, don't know anything about him. They have no understanding. The God of this world has blinded the minds of people. And then Romans chapter 1 is happening where they've chosen not to love the truth and God's given them up to a reprobate mind. They can't see the truth. They can't know the truth. We need to start praying for God just to intervene and do what he needs to do to bring this thing to an end. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen? Be a light in darkness. Be a testimony of the goodness of God. Make yourself available to those that are looking for help, looking for answers, and don't worry. Stand in faith believing. So he says, now this is a good part. The spirit of truth when, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. You know him. How do you know? You know him because he dwells with you and he's prophesying now 
and he's going to move in to you. <laughs> All right. He said, after I'm gone, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, is going to move into you. The Spirit of truth. Now, in religion, we have a lot of junk that's not truth. Why? Because we have not surrendered to truth. We've not surrendered to the will of God. We're doing our thing, building our kingdom, doing our work, making ourselves look good. And God says, is just saying to the church, just surrender to me and let me live through you. And if he lives through us, everything changes. He dwells in you and he will be in you. In him we live and move and have our being. He says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So, on the day of Pentecost, we know what happened now. The, the Holy Spirit that he's talking about here moved into the church. And we became, we became, as humans, we became the dwelling place of God. We became the temple. We no longer chase, follow after a tabernacle that's torn down and rebuilt throughout the wilderness. We no longer go to a temple in Jerusalem to worship God. You don't have to go to the Wailing Wall to worship God. You don't have to go to where the temple used to be to worship God. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead, and the veil in the temple has been torn in two. And every believer that chooses to follow God has instant, complete access to the Holy of Holies in the throne room, in the presence of God, anywhere, anytime, by the Spirit of God. He said, I'm not leaving you. You're not an orphan. Uh, you are my child. And I have moved in by the Spirit of God. He now lives and dwells in us. Now, I don't know. If that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet. I mean, just that understanding that we don't have to worry about defeat. Oh, but I'm going through such a trial. Well, yeah, everybody does. My goodness. But we overcome. We overcome. Why? Because the spirit of truth knows the answer to our problem before we get there. He knows the end result of what we're going through before we arrive at it. So what faith does, faith causes us to rest in the spirit of truth, the word of God. We rest in the promise. We take hold of the end of our faith and we bring it into our circumstance right now and we overcome. Yeah. I prayed for Charles and Stephanie last Sunday. And Stephanie and Latrice had a wreck today. And both of them were injured a little bit. Car was totaled. And talking to Charles for service, and they're home, they're, they're recovering, they're okay, but car is gone. Washing machine broke down, and the microwave broke down today. So, they, you know, they're, it's just one thing after another happening to them. But, you know, Charles is still believing God. Stephanie's still believing God. Everything the enemy intends for evil, God's going to use for good. Amen? That being said, if you know where there's a washing machine and a microwave, bless them with it. And a new car. Because we're the body of Christ. We're part of the family. But you see, we understand that in this world we go through experiences, but it doesn't really matter what we go through if we have the truth alive in us. And the truth is, this world is not my home the truth is this temporal experience is not the end of my story because there is a better day coming for all of us. Amen? All right, verse 19. I'm going to give you, we're going to go through three more verses. Try to. We'll pick back up here again next week. Verse 19, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. I like that combination. Jesus said, I'm in my Father, and I'm in you, and you are in me. Now, you can't go wrong with that. I'm in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Let's just get in Him and enjoy life. 
He who has my commandments and keeps them. Hold on. Whoa, whoa, hold. He who, he who has my commandments and keeps them. Hmm. I think he mentioned that earlier. So we've got to, let's, let's don't take those three words and keeps them out. He who has my commandments and keeps them. It is he who loves me. And look at this. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. What a powerful word. So, I'm not going to tell you to go to the book of Leviticus and look up all of the law and the commandments. I'm going to tell you to go to what Jesus said. He said, you have to obey these two things to obey all of my commandments. And if you don't do those two things, you can't have him manifest to you. He just told us. Those two things, what are they? Love God, love people, because that is a heart experience. It is a heart relationship with God. I love God, and because I love him, his love flows through me to you. And if it's not flowing from me to you, his love is not flowing to me because I'm not receiving it. Matthew 6, Matthew 18, right? So before I can walk in the revelation that he is going to manifest himself to me, I've got to walk in the revelation of his love for me that equips me to love those around me. And when I get all that working right, I'm, a, I'm more than a conqueror. Because my love causes me to not worry about what anybody says, thinks, or does. Because the love of God in me is greater than every other experience. And that's how we overcome. Now, what Jesus did when he went to hell and overcame Satan, made a show of him openly triumphing over him in it, took the keys of death and hell from him and gave them to us. And all that experience, he was just saying what we just talked tonight. He said, I'm giving you this authority to be an overcomer in the same way that I overcame. All you got to do is fall in love with me. Amen? Now, to display your love for God, you got to love that person beside you. Look at somebody beside you. Yeah, that's the one we're talking about. Amen. Let's stand together. And if you can't love the ones in the body, you can't love the ones in the world. This is where we're trained. We're baptized in the body of Christ. We're trained to love in the house. And when we learn to love and forgive our brothers and sisters, then we have an, equip, an equipping to love those that are still living in the world. And that's what God's called us to do. Amen. And he gives us wisdom and how to do it. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the revelation of truth that comes from your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit of truth that lives in us and flows through us and from us. Your will in heaven is done when we believe your word and act upon it in obedience. So, Father, thank you for speaking to us and changing our hearts. Thank you tonight, Lord, that we've received something that's made us more like you. We've received a revelation of truth that's changing us. And, Lord, we choose to surrender to your word tonight. Everything that we say and do, may it be for your glory. Order our steps. Lead us and guide us and direct us as we obey you. And we ask it in that name, the nature, the character of Jesus. Amen. Amen.